Thanks a lot. Thank you, Pete. Very excited about that. Uh, now, Nick McDavid, if you could come up, please. Uh, if you have um, never met Nick, he is from our Lim and North, uh, or Cinnamon Brow is what we like to call it, Lim and Cinnamon Brow churches. Uh, but he is here visiting us to continue on with our Five Words That Define Us series. So today, we're going to be talking about... Generous. Oh, generous. Wow. Okay, well, I'm going to pray for Nick, and then we'll get started. So if you guys could just extend your hands to Nick, please. Uh, thank you, Lord, so much for the word that you have put inside of Nick. Thank you that he is a vessel, that he is obedient to you, that, um, that you would put his, your words into him, and that he would be able to see you and hear you clearly, and that each one of us would take something unique away that you have spoken to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Great. Great to be here. Uh, Craig and I clearly have done swapsies. So, uh, Craig is in Cinnamon Broad this morning, and I am here. Everybody okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Three. Three of you are okay. That's good. So, <laughs> so Pete's taking this whole American thing on ho to heart, isn't he, really? <laughs> so, uh, we've been looking, we've been looking at, at some words that define us as a church, and today we're looking at the word generous. And I just want to remind you that the reason we're looking at these words isn't because we think... We suck at these things, and we really need to work on them. It's because we want these things to be uh, defining characteristics of who we are as Life Church. We're good at some of this stuff. We are. Uh, and you know that as, as a church here at Latchford, you know that you are generous in many different ways. So this isn't a, hey, get your act together, people. We need to be generous. That's not what this is about. This is about you are generous. You are people who love God. Uh, this is great, but let's work on the things that God wants us to do, the people that God wants us to become, so that we can live at a higher standard than maybe we've lived at previously. Um, when we talk about being generous, there, there are a few things that pop to mind. So there was a time in my life where my shower was broken. Yeah, it's horrendous. When your shower is broken, who has baths anymore? No one. Well, certainly not me. Yeah, okay, all right, there's, there's always people putting their hands up. So, <laughs> well, no, there was only four, so, you know. So, um, so my shower was broken, and uh, I just couldn't afford to replace it. I knew that I'd have to save it for a while to, to replace the shower. And uh, it came up in conversation at some point with some people. I can't remember the circumstances of how that happened. Um, but then one day, when I got home from work, someone had put an envelope through my door with m enough money in this envelope to pay for a new shower. That was quite impressive. And I was quite, I was quite touched by that. It was an anonymous gift. Well, it was meant to be anonymous, but um, I have some friends, and their house particularly smelt of a certain type of washing powder, and the envelope smelt the same. So, <laughs> so I was able to work out who it was. Uh, but when we talk about generous, those are the stories that we like. We like the, oh my word, somebody stuck an envelope through my door, it had money in it, somebody was generous towards me. But I think it's worth remembering that actually God is, has been, and will continue to be incredibly generous to us. He is incredibly generous to us. And maybe the first place I'll start at this morning is to remind us just how generous God is to us. He sent His Son. He sent His Son to take our place. He continues to bless us. The Bible says that His mercies are new every morning. Every morning, God's mercies to us are new. He is incredibly generous to us and incredibly kind to us. And maybe the thing that we need to do, and I know it's something that I need to do, maybe the thing that we need to do is just to say, God, will you help me to see your kindness today? It isn't that it isn't there. It's that sometimes we don't notice it. God, will you help me to see your kindness today? Help me to see your generosity today. I believe as followers of Jesus, because God is generous to us, if we want to represent him well, we need to also have this characteristic as part of who we are. If we will represent God well, then being generous is one of the ways that we will do that. I came across this quote. It says this. And it's very challenging. The generosity of a believer is the greatest revelation of the authenticity of their understanding of the gospel. The generosity of a believer is the greatest revelation of the authenticity of their understanding of the gospel. How generous you are 
is a reflection of how you understand or how much you understand what God has done for you. That's what uh, Pastor Josh White said there. So Jesus is kind to us. So what I'm going to do this morning is uh, I've turned into Lucas. I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do today. I don't like doing that. I like it to be a surprise. Uh, but today, I want to tell you where we're going. Because, because we're talking about generosity, and I know that as soon as, you, as soon as you mention generosity, some people get a little bit tense. So I want to tell you where we're going with generosity today, okay? We're going to look at the life of David, because uh, he had an incredible attitude towards God as far as generosity is concerned. I'm going to tell you three things about David's response to God in generosity. And then I'm going to tell you five things that generosity is not, uh, because it's worth pointing out what generosity isn't, because we can think sometimes about what generosity is, and we can get confused, and we can have assumptions. I'm going to tell you five things that generosity isn't, and then I'm going to wrap up with a little challenge for us. So that's where we're going today. Is that okay? I love that you said yes, because whether it's okay or not, that's what we're doing. (laughs) So David, you may have heard of David. He was the guy in the story, the little guy who took on the giant, yeah, Goliath, and uh, after that, people loved him, he was well respected, and the king who was the king at the time did not like that people were loving David and not really giving him any, the attention he felt he deserved. And so there was this kind of hatred that the king, Saul, his name was, had towards David, and David eventually had to run away for his life, and then people went with David, he eventually became king, and uh, in fact became one of the greatest kings of the nation of Israel. Now, the thing I like about David is later on in Scripture, in Acts, actually, it talks about David, and it says this incredible sentence. It says, David was a man after God's own heart, a man after God's heart. Some version says, David pursued God with everything he had. Now, I don't want to hold David up as an example in the sense that everything he did was amazing, because everything he did was not amazing, okay? He was a great king. He led his people well. He did some amazing things. He wrote some amazing psalms. He pursued God, but he was not perfect. He made many mistakes. He was a flawed man. He had an affair, and he tried to cover up the fact that he had an affair by having the, the woman's husband murdered. So this isn't, this isn't a guy we like, ooh, role model. I'm going to do everything he does. No, he also was a terrible parent. Okay? He, he made a lot of mistakes. But the thing that's mentioned about him later in Scripture is he pursued God. He pursued God. God. And I love the fact that there's a moment where David is confronted with something that he's done that's terrible, and he realizes that he's done something terrible, and he doesn't try to explain it away like maybe I would do. He says, yeah, it's me. I've done that. I'm sorry. And he cries out to God, search me, Lord. Test me. See if there's anything wicked in me. He has this response to God where as soon as he recognizes there's something not right, he works to make it right. He pursued God. And I found that as I was reading scripture, uh, part of David having his heart towards God was the way that he was generous to God. And this is what I want to challenge us with this morning, how we can be generous to God uh, like David was. The first thing is this, he had an incredible desire to honor God, incredible desire to honor God. Uh, The Bible says that David was sat in his palace one day and it was an extravagantly built palace. And he looked around his palace and at the time, The place the people would meet to worship God was in a tent that they had constructed. And David was sat in his glorious palace, and he thought, this isn't right. My palace is amazing. We worship God in a tent. We need to do something about this. In fact, I'm going to do something about this. So he calls the prophet in, and he says, listen, I want to build God a house. I'm going to build God a temple because we're meeting in a tent, and it's rubbish. We need something glorious to represent God well. I want to build something magnificent to represent God well. He had a desire to honor God. And then the prophet, in fact, it's a funny story. The prophet initially says, yeah, do it. Then the prophet goes home and God says, tell him no. That's, that's not what he's doing. So the prophet has to come back and say, I know I said you need to do it, but actually God's spoken and you need to not do it because God wants the person who builds a temple to be a man of peace, and you've been a man of war, and it's great that you have this passion to build a temple, but someone else needs to do it. And I love David's reaction. I know what my reaction would have been. It would have been, fair enough, that's okay, someone else can do it, and I would have moved on to something else. But David had such a heart to honor God that he said, okay, if I can't build it, I can provide for it. 
if I can't build this temple for God, then I will provide for whoever is going to be. It was going to be his son, Solomon. And so David, as the king, begins to gather all these materials together so that when it was Solomon's turn to build a temple, everything that he needed would be there. He had an incredible desire to honor God. It wasn't about what he wanted to do and being sad about not being able to do what he wanted to do. He thought, I will make a way for the next person to be able to do this well. The second thing is uh, David had incredible understanding of cost. <laughs> and I find this challenging. So in this instance, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 24, uh, David had done, again, something that he shouldn't have done. And the punishment, the kind of, re- not punishment per se, but the consequences of, the, of his actions meant that there was a plague in the nation. and People were dying. And, uh, and God spoke to David and said, you need to go to this guy's, he named a guy, Arun, I think his name was, you need to go to his uh, field, and you need to offer a sacrifice in his field, and then the plague will stop. So David arrives at this guy's field. Now, imagine this is your field, and the king of the nation turns up and says, I need to buy your field from you. And you can see in 2 Samuel 24 that the people really loved David as their king. They loved uh, who he was. They loved his connection with God. They loved his heart. And Aruna looks at David and says, you are the king, and you're in my field, and you want my field, so you can have it. You can just have it. And, and if, you, if you need to make an offering, because remember in those days they were making animal sacrifices, if you need to make an offering to God, then you can have some of my animals and there's some wood here you can use. You just take what you need, king, and use whatever you want to. You can just have it. You are the king. You can just have it, which is great. That's a great response. But then David has an even greater response in 2 Samuel chapter 24. After he says this all to him, David says this, no. He says, I insist in buying it, for I will not present to the Lord something that cost me nothing. I will not present to the Lord something that cost me nothing. You see, he understood cost. As far as generosity was concerned, he understood cost. And he didn't want to turn up to God and offer something that was someone else's. It had to be something that was his. And so he insisted, even though he could have got it for free, he insisted on paying for it so that he could offer something to God that was costly to him. And we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about generosity. But sometimes generosity isn't about cash. It isn't always about money. A lot of the time it's about who we are and what we bring to each other. And sometimes, and you may have been in this circumstance, you may be in a service And actually raising your hands to worship is costly. Maybe because you don't want people to have an assumption about who you are, or maybe you're embarrassed, or maybe things are really tough in your life, and you're going through a difficult situation, and you think, this is really difficult to do, God, but it's costing me, and I'm going to do it anyway. And sometimes we have to step up and take on the cost and respond to God in generosity And one of the ways that we can do that is to recognize just how generous he is to us. David understood cost. And the final thing I want to talk about David, it's not the final bit of the sermon, just in case you wondered and you got all a bit excited. Yeah, sorry. The final bit I want to talk about David is his recognition of the source, his recognition of the source. So what happens is uh, he collects, as king, he collects all of the, the money that they need. He collects all of the stuff that they need. And then he uh, provides for his son Solomon to build a temple. And then they build this magnificent uh, temple. And then uh, David prays. So this is in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I'm going to read some bits to you because it is incredible. So it says, 1 Chronicles 29 says, Then King David turned to the entire assembly, so everybody has come together for the dedication of this temple that they've made. Uh, And he says, My son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. The work ahead of him is enormous, for the temple he will build is not for mere mortals. It is for the Lord God himself. Using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for building the temple of my God. Now there is enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, as well as lots of other costly stones and all kinds of fine stone and marble. So he's pointing out that as king, he's collected all this stuff. Verse 3, and now because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I'm going to give 
I'm going to be giving all of my own private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. This is in addition to the building materials I've already collected for his holy temple. I'm donating more than 111 tons of gold and 262 tons of silver to be used for overlaying the walls of the building. So as king, David had collected stuff over the years for the temple. At the dedication, he says, I've already collected all this stuff, and now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dig into my own personal finances, my own personal resources, and I'm going to offer those for the construction of the temple. And he mentions how much it is. 112 tons of gold is a lot. I'm just saying. Okay, I looked it up. That's 30 million pounds. 30 million pounds. It doesn't mention how much the silver was, because I could have looked that up. But I was just blown away by the fact that David decided he was going to give his own personal treasure of 30 million pounds back in that day to the building of the temple. That was incredible. That was an incredible act of generosity. But the reason he does it, he kind of reveals later on. So he says this in verse 5. Uh, now then, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? And you can imagine the people thinking, well, David, seriously, you've just given 30 million quid. There's just no way we can follow your example. But, but it isn't about amount. It's about heart. And the Bible says, then the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals, the captains of the armies, and the king's administrative officers, they all gave willingly. So all of the leaders came together, and they dug into their pockets, and they gave. And then it lists in verse 7, it says they gave 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins. You can imagine everybody getting really excited about what they were doing, and, and just it's just a, like a big party. After they contributed all of this stuff, verse 9 says, The people rejoiced over the offerings, for they had given, and this is so important as far as giving is concerned, they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord, and the king, King David, was filled with joy. The generosity is about giving freely and wholeheartedly. It is not about giving on the compulsion. If you feel you need to give on the compulsion, that is not what the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about giving freely and wholeheartedly. Verse 10, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. O oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. He had an incredible recognition of the source. He's saying, God, you've given us everything, and we're just giving it back to you. That's all this is. This isn't about me saying, I've got 30 million pounds and I'm giving it to God. Woo, aren't I great? He's saying, this, it was yours in the first place. I'm just giving it back to you. I love the fact that you can carry on reading that in, uh, in 1 Chronicles 29. He then, goes on, he then goes on to say, who am I that we are able to give this stuff to you? And who are my people? And he has this, there's this sense that, that giving isn't a chore, that being generous isn't a chore. It's exciting, and it is such a pleasure and a privilege that we get to give this stuff to you, God. This is amazing. This is amazing. And God, will you help us to have the same attitude that says we recognize that everything we have comes from you anyway, and we're just giving it back to you anyway. So let's jump through five things. Five things that generosity is not Remembering that the way that David leads us, in a sense, is that he had a desire to honor God. He understood the cost, and he recognized the source of everything that he had, that it came from God in the first place. Five things that generosity is not. Number one, generosity is not about how much you give. It really isn't. You know, there's a great instance in the Bible where the Pharisees were around and I love it where Jesus is talking to Pharisees because they always thought they were all that, and then Jesus would bring them down. It was great. Uh, but then I felt challenged once because I realized that there's Pharisee in all of us. And so I didn't poke fun at the Pharisees anymore after that. 
But anyway, it was great. It was great when uh, Jesus would interact with those people who had that sense that they um, were above everyone else, a sense of self-righteousness, a sense that they would follow the law, and a sense that they were higher than everyone else. And Jesus would say, that's not how I roll. That's not what this is all about. So they're having a conversation. Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples, and they were talking about giving. And Jesus pointed out to this poor widow who'd put two coins in, and he said, she gave more than everyone else. Here's the thing. Generosity isn't about how much. It is about your heart. It isn't about who gives more than who. And so even though we can be amazed by the fact that David gave 30 million pounds, that is amazing. But actually, you having a heart that says, I'm giving everything that I have to God, may very well be more than that. Because we have that, that response, that attitude to say, I am giving what I have in terms of who, you've, who you are to me, Jesus, and what you've done in my life. I am pouring out of that. So generosity isn't about quantity. It isn't about how much. It is about what you have in your heart and your heart towards God. Yes, I planned it that way. (laughs) Generosity, Generosity is not a single action. We can't be defined by one thing that we do. So having one act where we're really generous... And then we carry on holding on to everything else that we have. That's not being generous. If we're going to be people who are generous, we need to be consistently generous. It needs to be something that we work into the fabric of our day-to-day living, into the fabric of the things that we are doing. We need to be consistent in terms of our generosity. Third thing, the generosity isn't, it isn't about giving from the stuff that you have left over. That's not generous. It's kind and it's useful. Yeah, if you have something that you don't need and someone else needs it, it is kind to share those things. But actually, true generosity is where we recognize that everything that we have comes from God, and we're responding out of, the, out of that firstly rather than from what we have left. It isn't, um, generosity isn't a last resort. It is our first thought. True generosity is a first thought, not a last resort. Uh, number four, I think it is. Generosity isn't just about being a blessing. Because I have discovered in my life, and I'm sure you have, that when you are generous, something happens inside you. So it isn't just about being a blessing to someone else and someone else receiving something or being blown away by kindness or any of that stuff. That is great and it is important. But I've discovered that actually something happens in me when I'm generous. And it may not be, it may not be that, you know, I get some generosity back and... Uh, <laughs> And sometimes, Lord help me, sometimes that is my expectation, yeah? So, true story. In fact, all the stories are true. Nobody lies from the front. Uh, Well, they shouldn't lie ever, not just from the front. Anyway, (laughs) uh, so back in the day, I, there was a pair of boots that I wanted, and I saved up for this pair of boots, and uh, I was really excited about buying these boots because I'm quite frugal. Uh, So, I'd saved up for a while, got the, I was ready to buy these boots, and uh, it was, I was going to buy them on a Saturday afternoon. On the Saturday morning, very foolishly, I went to a conference. And in the conference, there was this guy got up and he was talking about the fact that um, they were going to do a different conference in Europe. And they were going to get all these pastors together who were poor and, and couldn't afford to, to do the stuff that they needed to do. They were going to train the pastors and equip them and send them back out. But, of course, the pastors couldn't afford to come to this conference, and so they were looking for people to sponsor a pastor to go to this conference so that they could be trained. And then he said how much it was going to cost to sponsor a pastor. It was exactly the amount of money that I've saved for my boots. And I felt, you know, when those things come together and you think, (laughs) and you think, actually, God, everything, everything is yours anyway. So I responded, and instead of buying the boots, I gave this money to sponsor a pastor, someone I would never meet, and hopefully who's doing great at the moment. (laughs) But this is generally what happened in my head. I'm going to give this money. I'm going to get home. Outside my house, (laughs) there's going to be a box. And someone will have anonymously bought exactly the pair of boots my size that I want, because God does stuff like that. Yeah, I'm still waiting (laughs) for this box to appear. And sometimes we can, have that, we can have that kind of expectation where I'm going to be generous because it's going to come back to me. And the Bible does talk about 
sowing and reaping. There is, an inst there is an instance, an expectation, an anticipation that those things will happen. But here's the thing. Sometimes the giving of stuff that may cost us is so that God does some work in us. And I have found, particularly in my own life, I have found that, that being generous helps me fight two things in my own heart. It helps me fight against selfishness, which happens, and it helps me fight against materialism, which happens. And I find that as I am generous, those two things get destroyed. But I have to keep doing it because those two things keep rearing up from time to time, and I have to make sure that they are destroyed. So giving and being generous isn't just a blessing to other people. It also does stuff in us. And finally, the, thing, the last thing that generosity is not is it's not just about money. It has a lot to do with money. Of course it does. But it isn't just about money. We can be generous with our time. We can be generous in our words. We can be generous with our love. We can be generous with the things that we already have. We can be generous in so many ways because God is generous to us in so many ways. And so it isn't just about money. So I don't want you to get hooked up or, or stuck on the thought that being generous is about putting money in envelopes and sticking it anonymously through doors. If that is a great thing to do. And if God tells you to do that, please respond in that way because you don't know who's on the other side of the door and what they may need. But it isn't just about money. It is about much more than that. In my, uh, in my daily reading, I came across this verse, Romans chapter 12. It says, uh, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And one of the things I like to do is read verses in different versions because it just, sometimes you can have an expectation when you're used to hearing a verse in a particular version, you can miss something in it. And I just happened to read it in a different version, which says this, never hold a grudge or try to get even, but plan your life around the noblest way to benefit others. And that's what being generous is about. Plan your life around the noblest way to benefit others. Generosity shouldn't be something that just happens accidentally. It should be something that we plan to do. And it's nice to be spontaneous. And it's nice to be, it's nice to be ooh, I've, I've had a thought. I'm just going to respond with that thought. But also, how much better would it be if we planned to do those things? So let me tell you a story of something I planned to do. And uh, don't worry, I know that I'm not going to get a blessing for it because I'm talking about it. But I'm not telling you about it because I'm amazing. I'm telling you about it because it is about the planning. Uh, so one of the things I always wanted to do, and I don't know why, but I always wanted to be in a restaurant with a group of people having a meal and then pay for everyone. <laughs> I wanted to do that. I don't know why. I thought it would be fun. Um, but I can't do that because that's a lot of money. And uh, I don't have a pound note tree in my back garden I did have, but they're all old pound coins, so it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. So, so how, would I, how would I do that? Well, I planned. I decided that I would save a little bit every month, put it aside, because one day I was going to pay for everyone in the room. And so uh, over the years, a few guys, we got together. We'd go to a men's conference in Bradford, and then uh, this is from my previous church, and then We'd go to the service on the Friday, and then on the Friday night, we'd go out to an Indian restaurant, because why wouldn't you when you're in Bradford? Uh, so we'd go to an Indian restaurant, we have, we'd have a curry together, and then we'd go to bed. Um, we'd go back to our hotel, not just go to bed in an Indian restaurant. Just thought I'd make that very clear. Uh, so we're in this Indian restaurant, and Ethan was with me, my son was with me, and I said, Ethan, we're going to do it today. I'm going to pay for everyone. It's going to be great. And I genuinely, I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited to do this. And let me just encourage you, it is so exciting. Being generous is exciting. I'm so excited to do this. So we had, we had our dinner, and everyone's chatting, and uh, I, I got up to go to the toilet, and then after, I came and snuck back to the bar, and I said, can I have the bill, please? And he handed me the bill, and then I just paid for it. And then I went and sat back down. And then everybody started getting ready to leave, and then they're doing this, oh, we need to pay. And then people are faffing about with bits of money and who ordered what and all of this stuff. I hate that part. Just, just want to say, I hate that part. Christians don't do this well. I just want to say that. <laughs> yeah, we don't do this well. Yeah, and oh, I didn't, no, I didn't have, no, I didn't have extra rice. No, you, you had a not, I would just, please, stop. But anyway, <laughs> and it's awful, isn't it? It is awful. So, but I said, it's fine. Guys, it's fine. Uh, it's sorted. Don't worry about it. It's sorted. Be blessed. And then we get awkward, don't we? We get awkward because it's like, well, ooh, 
because we don't know how to receive generosity. And sometimes receiving generosity is just as difficult as giving generosity. And then instead of, and I'm just as bad, or used to be just as bad, I'm not anymore. And then instead of just saying, thanks, it becomes, well, I'll pay for your breakfast tomorrow. Or I'll buy coffees for you tomorrow. Or next time we go out, I'll pay for you. It's like, please, please, just be grateful. Just receive it. God is so good to us. Just receive what he has given us. And it was genuinely, it was a really exciting evening for me. I was so excited. I will probably do it again at some point in five years when I've saved up again. But it is so exciting. Now, here's the thing. If you sat there (laughs) and you're thinking, I can't wait to go out for a meal with Nick (laughs) because he's going to pay. That's not what generosity is. What you should be thinking is, I can't wait to go out for a meal with Nick so that I can pay. (laughs) Because that's what generosity is. Yeah? So I'm not saying that because I want you all to invite me out for a meal and then pay. I'm saying that because when I hear stories like that, it, when, and when you hear a story, you place yourself in the story, whether you realize that or not. When I place myself in the story, I place myself on the receiving end. Yeah? Maybe you're much more spiritual than I am. But in a story like that, I would place myself on the receiving end and think, oh, it'd be great to be sat there and then be surprised that someone paid for my dinner. I generally don't place myself in the, oh, I would love to pay for everyone as well. And so part of being generous is that we plan how we're going to be generous. And it may be that you put aside some money uh, on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis. It may be that you plan to have someone around for a meal, that you plan to take someone out for a coffee, that you investigate to find out when their birthday is and you plan to get them something. I don't know. You need to listen to what God is saying to you. But part of being generous is that we're prepared for it and we make some plans. We have to be intentional. It won't just happen. We have to be intentional about it. Uh, I mentioned this verse earlier. It talks about sowing and reaping. Let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. There's another version that says, God loves hilarious generosity. Hilarious generosity. So I want to challenge us all to be people who aren't just (laughs) like I am sometimes, expecting the generosity to come to me expecting other people to be generous to me, but actually make plans of how can I be generous to other people. And it is such an incredible blessing to make a difference in other people's lives. It's such an incredible blessing to be part of changing a circumstance, to be maybe, maybe you don't realize that, that sometimes giving something to someone else reminds them that God loves them and that God cares about what's happening in their lives, and even if in, in a very small way, reminds them that they are precious to Him, so much so that He told you to do something to help them. I mean, that's incredible. It is incredible. And I was thinking about this this morning. It all belongs to God anyway, and God just moves it around. He just moves the stuff around. So you give to someone else, and then they give to someone else. God's just moving His stuff around. And we have this opportunity to be incredible part of this beautiful dance of giving and receiving, of generosity and blessing. We have an incredible opportunity to be part of this all. So let me just pray for us. Lord, I thank you for your generosity to me. I thank you that uh, there's so many stories I could share of, of, of surprising things that you did just to show me that you love me and care for me and that you hear the things that I ask for. And Lord, I pray for all of us. I pray that you forgive us for being people who uh, sometimes expect other people to be generous to us. Lord, there is that, that, that kind of selfishness sometimes and that sense of materialism that, that, that works its way into the fabric of our being, and we don't want that. We don't want that. We want to be people who represent you well. And so I thank you for the incredibly generous people in this room already who open their homes to other people, who uh, share their lives with other people, who bless other people, who, who are just kind in the way that they live. I thank you for that. And I pray that, that we would continue to be known as a people who are generous. I pray that you help us to step out of our comfort zone sometimes. I pray that you help us to recognize that there is a cost to being generous, but it costs you everything to send your son to die for us on the cross. And so I pray that our response to you 
would be an appropriate response, that we would recognize like David recognized, who are we that we get to give stuff to you? Who are we that we get to honor you with our lives and with the things that you have given to us? So help us, Jesus, to have that frame of mind that sees that everything we have is from you anyway. And I pray that you'd further develop us into becoming a people who are generous. In your name, amen. Wonderful. Thank you, Nick. I am uh, excited and motivated and challenged to look at life through the lens of generosity, and I hope you guys are too. Um, That is it for this morning. I just want to remind you, next week we are not here. We are at the Par Hall for 1030, and we hope to see all of you there. Have a great week.